This Restorative Justice Life is a production of Amplify RJ. Follow us on all social media platforms at Amplify RJ or sign up for our email list to stay up to date on everything we have going on. And to get the most involved, join our free Mighty Networks community to get connected with others living this restorative justice life all over the world. As far as this podcast goes, make sure you're subscribed, leave our rating and review, and share with a friend to help us further amplify this work. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to This Restorative Justice Life, the podcast that explores how the philosophy, practices, and values of restorative justice apply to our everyday lives. I'm your host, David Ryan Barcega Castro Harris, all five names for the ancestors, and I'm the founder of Amplify RJ. On this podcast, I talk with RJ practitioners, circle keepers, and others doing this work about how this way of being has impacted their lives. Daniel, welcome to This Restorative Justice Life. Who are you? I am a social worker and an educator. Who are you? I am a restorative justice practitioner. Who are you? (laughs) I am a Buddhist and a Quaker. (laughs) Who are you? Um, I am a hermit, somewhat of a monk, which is complicated for some people. I can always get into that later, too. Who are you? <laughs> a community builder. Who are you? And this is the great part of being a community builder. I am a, goes with the hermit, an introvert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last time for this, uh, who are you? I, <clears throat> I'm a student. I'm a, a lover of learning. I just love to read and study and learn people and things and ideas and anything else out there i just try to absorb it all in beautiful well we're gonna get to all the intersections of who you are just after this hey folks i'm elise your producer and today we are welcoming daniel rhodes to the podcast daniel is the director of the undergraduate social work program at unc greensboro Daniel is also trained in dialectal behavioral therapy as a form of cognitive behavioral therapy that uses mindfulness to address issues related to trauma and has been a clinical supervisor and restorative justice practitioner that engages and trains students in communities and peacemaking. As always, thank you for listening and let's get right back into it. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for being here. It's good to reconnect after a long time. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but, you know, it's always good to check in. So to the extent that you want to answer the question in the moment, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. It's it's an end of a semester, so we have about um, three weeks left, and so it's always overwhelming. Um, I'm a director of an undergraduate program of about 400 students, and... There are different levels of stress and anxiety among the students uh, coming out of the kind of COVID world and they're, you know, students getting ready to go into their senior year, students getting ready to graduate. And I'm kind of the <clears throat> touch person, touchstone person for them that I have to kind of deal with. So I'm, I'm hanging in there. <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. Um, you know, I can't complain. I could, but I, I can't complain. I'm actually doing pretty well. Thank you. How are you? You probably uh, asked that question. Oh, uh, sometimes people do, sometimes people don't. Um, for those of you who have listened to the podcast a lot, um, you'll you might recognize that this episode is being aired out of order. So I am three weeks out um, from being a new father, and you can assume all the things that uh, come with that—all the beauty, all the gratitude, all the stress, all the exhaustion. Um, but you know, right now, very very present. Um, he's eating right now and then hopefully after that he'll be sleeping so <laughs> hoping for relative quiet <laughs> during during this recording um i i'm i'm grateful for your your presence um and your your response going from like good to like i'm hanging on <laughs> but, and like you know Brian, yeah. i it it's it's the nature of you know, these times, yeah. right? Uh, but thank you for sharing all those things. I'm I'm curious, uh, you know, I was going to ask this later, but you mentioned it in your who are you questions, uh, responses, um, as a Buddhist and a Quaker, how do you, how, how does your faith impact how you 
get to that space of being able to hang on, be good in the midst of all of this work? Great question. I wasn't expecting a question like that. You've, I, I don't know how to answer. No, I'm just kidding. I, you know, I think it's really, it's interesting in that I've just recently reconnected with a, a Quaker group. So, you know, I, the area I'm from in North Carolina is kind of Quaker central, almost uh, Guilford College is here. It was on the Underground Railroad. A lot of Quakers have worked here. So there's a long history and um, <clears throat> Quakers come in two different, well, more than two. I, I don't want to generalize, but there's two main traditions. There's the um, kind of conservative friends, which is non unprogrammed and the program, which is more like a church setting. And I go, of course, to the unprogrammed because it's silent. There's no minister. It's all kind of consensus based and we work together, make decisions together. And <clears throat> I have reconnected and it's interesting. I reconnected to that community because they had reached out to me before the pandemic um, because they wanted me to come and do a circle process with them. You know, I had stayed connected with the community somewhat, but was not as active with them because of other things going on in my life and still connected with members of that, um, what calls, you know, a um, friend's meeting house. And they reached out to me and they said, we'd really like for you to come and, and do a circle process. There's some internal conflicts and we want you to do that. And so I met with them and then the pandemic did. And so then over the past year, they reached out to me because I had written another chapter about in a, in a Quaker book about how Quaker has, Quakerism has influenced my teaching and restorative justice practice, along with, you know, Mennonites and stuff. And so um, I said, I really need to reconnect with this group. I, I miss this group. Um, I need that kind of grounding of being able to go to a space. Initially, it was Zoom. And then being in the space. Now we're kind of a hybrid where I go in the space and sit in that Quaker meeting house on Sunday for an hour quietly. And I have my own meditative practices in the morning, which I am very, very protective of um, in that when I have meetings, I still carve out like I try as best I can. I try to establish meetings. I don't have control over all the meetings, but I try to establish the meetings where I have my practices in the morning, which is getting up and rituals and some chanting and, and a little bit of meditating and brewing tea and just sitting quietly. And so um, I, those practices have really helped sustain me through a lot of this. So they, they've been very, really important to me. And um, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's just been an important process that I've really, and it's been good to reconnect with a faith community. I don't design, define myself as very religious, but it's nice to have reconnected with a faith community that, that um, provides support through these times and stuff so yeah uh i ask that question that's not like the traditional way that we jump into these conversations but sometimes when i feel it i ask that question because people again who listen to this podcast often know um i struggle with like the the boundaries that quote-unquote self-care uh requires and lots of people come on here talking about like their militant boundaries, their militant dedication to carving out that space. And, you know, I just hope that like through your, <laughs> through yeah. your answer, some of that finally rubs off on me and like navigating that as a new parent um, is, is something that I am having to re-navigate um, as well. But, you know, you, you telegraphed some of the things that we're going to get into. Um, we often like to start these conversations asking, you know, you've been doing restorative justice work for a minute now, mm -hmm. uh, but probably before you even had the framework for the words restorative justice. Exactly. So um, <laughs> in your own words, how did this get started for you? That's a great point. Two things I want to say something about boundaries. It's really funny because uh, <clears throat> we talk about boundaries, boundaries quite a bit. My first job was in a community mental health center and there was a group called Flexible Boundaries. <laughs> and I said, that's such an oxymoron, but what a great term. Because we have to have boundaries, but they have to be flexible. So I always love that idea, flexible boundaries. But <clears throat> yes, you, yeah, that's a great way to frame it. Because I had, and I think this is why I'm, I am so, I, how do I, how I frame it? Um, you know, because I, I joke about trying to indoctrinate social work students into restorative justice practices. But I think a lot of what I do and the passion that comes of, of teaching restorative justice is that it wasn't a framework when I was a student. <clears throat> and I remember struggling as a social worker and a community social worker because I got into social work for very specific reasons. I came from being in the military. You know, I was 18 years old, went in the military. Like I grew up in an era of this kind of 
hegemonic toxic masculinity where you're supposed to go in the military you're supposed to be a police officer and i'm in these settings like this is not where i'm supposed to be and came to social work because of these values and ethics which revolves around social justice and so i get into the profession and, and was just struggling in the profession like this is you know it, it has a weird kind of the term that i often use in class is soft cops it has this weird kind of soft cop feel to it and that social work can be a very uh, oppressive structure. And I've had some very difficult conversations with people who've been in this profession and that, you know, we're a profession. There's, there's different perspectives of this profession and we're part of a profession in some ways it reinforces system structural oppression. And, you know, that's not our code of ethics. Our code of ethics is standing up against social injustices. And so how do we do that? And I've had these really difficult conversations when I referenced that where social workers like how dare you how dare you you know i'm like yeah we have to we have to interrogate that within ourselves and i don't know the, exactly when i stumbled on the idea of restorative justice i just know that when i was in the profession i started to try to think differently than because i got into this profession i joke now because i can you know I, in the 1900s <laughs> so it was like 1994 when i finished my undergraduate degree and i went on to get my master. So it's like the, you know, late nineties, early two thousands. But, you know, I also remember apartheid in South Africa. And I also remember the truth and reconciliation process. And I also remember reading and studying about this stuff, but it was on the periphery because that was such an abstract, broad community base, you know, and I, I didn't know that you could bring social work down to a level of where I was working with people directly individually, but I saw it in a broad structure within countries with the truth and reconciliation process. And I, I don't think it was until the doc, when I was in my doctoral program, which was this really kind of quirky, cool program where I did have a professor who started to teach about the truth and reconciliation process in our courses. And we had Greensboro had the truth and reconciliation process because of the 1979 Klan massacre. Um, so that, you know, I was starting to get this information from different places. And that's when I started to kind of connect the dots. And I was like, that's what I was trying to do in my profession. I just didn't have the language to articulate it. And I wish I had had that language to articulate it. And so then as I moved forward, kind of staying in the profession, really reading and studying a lot of this stuff, then I started to develop that language to articulate what I was trying to do and what this profession really needs to be centered and grounded in. And ironically, started teaching at Guilford College and started teaching restorative justice, you know, like, wow, I'm now teaching what I wish I could have learned 20 years ago. And, you know, really starting to, to study it and take courses in it and trying to understand how does this look in the community level at what you what we call in social work is micro meso and macro you know looking at mm -hmm. individuals families and groups and then large community systems and stuff like that and so it was probably when i was in guilford um it was right after guilford i started going up to eastern mennonite and taking courses up there it's like I, I need not only just to to study this but i need the framework of how to structure it and cobble it into our curriculum and to get students to understand that we are restorative justice practitioners as social workers we work with harms and trauma in the community we can't function unless we are restorative justice practitioners um, because we have the potential to re-traumatize communities and, and individuals and so that's kind of where that trajectory, which I know is not a very clear timeline, but I think that's how a lot of us come to restorative justice. You know, we, I think we have it within us and going back to the Buddhism thing, you know, in, in Mahanya Buddhism, it's this, you have the Buddha inside you, you're trying to bring it out. And I think that's how it is in restorative justice. We, I think we have it for those of us who come to this kind of work, we have it inside of us. We just don't know it until we're able to find those spaces where we can articulate it and start to kind of bring it to the surface and it's like oh wow it now makes sense this is what i've been trying to do all along so um i hope that makes sense yeah definitely uh it reminds me of you know something that Kay Pranis talks about where like a teaching is a rekindling of a truth that we have inside of us right um and you know there is a good wise 
powerful core self in in all of us that we need to remember be reminded of and you know circle practice is a great way of doing that it's not the only way right um but it's there really are good. so many <laughs> yeah um th there are a couple things in there that i wanted to go back on and i'm realizing now as uh you were just sharing like why i resonated very deeply with your chapter and i don't think you knew this but i halfway finished an msw um, wow. yeah and the institution that i was at was very micro focused many of the people um in there um, i'm gonna name it were uh, white women who were trying to be therapists yeah. um <laughs> and for me like the program that just wasn't it um i went i did my grad school work in chicago and when i thought about chicago the birthplace of social work yeah. right whole house mm -hmm. jane adams um a lot of the things that you were talking about um that were more on the uh macro mezzo level were the things that i was attracted to and that particular program just wasn't it for for me at the time and so i didn't finish it no hard no hard feelings other yeah. than like the thirty thousand dollars, I still have yeah. in debt. But like, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to the evolution of the social work profession to be like, in some ways, like the soft arm of the state. I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and I think it's I, I'm I have been in this profession long enough to see a little bit of a transition in in many different levels. And there's a book I think it's called Fallen Angels. It's uh, about the hyper-professionalization of social work. And there's two trajectories in social work. And I think that, and I, I have a lot of, a, I, I do have a lot of opinions. I have a lot of history with it and a lot of ideas. And so I have to be cautious that I don't ramble on for hours about it. But, um, you know, it's, I, I often say that in some of us who do this, because I have a clinical license, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, um, is that, you know, there, social work suffers a lot from self-esteem issues you know, we're not a social science in a lot of ways. I, there would be many who'd argue like sociology or psychology. There would be social workers who would argue, yes, we are, we're a social science. And I'm like, interestingly, you know, as you've noticed in the chapter, we have a code of ethics and we have social work values. One of them is the importance of human relationship of which I have yet to learn how to lecture about. And so I think that as social, work, <laughs> yeah, you know, as social work faculty and social work professors, you know, I, we have to understand that we are not traditional academics. We, we serve in academic settings. We have to deal with academic stuff, but our primary responsibility is to prepare people to go into the world and work as social workers. And so there, that history of hyper-professionalization is this medical model that they adopted of credentialing and licensure, which is important, but it's not the only thing. And I think that that's been my frustration as a person who is a licensed clinical social worker, because I will see, I see that among a lot of students, I see a lot more students who are a lot more savvy about what they want to do. So if you were to ask students 20 years ago about clinical social work, I think most of them were like, what is that? And now I can sit in class with students like, how many of you want to get your clinical license? And they all raise their arms, uh, you know, so I know for a lot of them, they had this projection in their head of, I'm going to get my MSW, I'm going to get my license, I'm going to open up a private practice. And I think there's some unrealistic expectations on what that looks like. And so I'm having to always try to, and that's why I think I'm really grounded in undergraduate education, because I really, it's, mm. I think it's easy to teach. I don't say easy, that's kind of a really good word, but I think it's a little bit, I am going to use easy because I can't think of another word right now, to teach graduate students, you know, because you don't deal with the same cognitive developmental issues that you do with a 20, 21 year old undergraduate student. And I love working with undergraduate students because I think that abstractly they see this in the terms of I'm going to be a therapist. And I'm like, that's years of experience and practice. <laughs> that's not something that happens overnight. You're not going to wake up one morning and here's your LCSW and you have a, a you know group of clients that are waiting for you. And so I'm trying to pull them back a little bit and to get them to understand that you're just not working with one person. What distinguishes social work from counseling ed is that we have a code of ethics, social justice being one of them, and it is our ethical responsibility to fight those social injustices that marginalize, disenfranchise, and oppress other people. That's why you see a lot of Paula Freire through that text. 
And to me, there's nothing that merges Frary and just social work better than restorative justice, you know, because yeah. it's challenging of that kind of banking model of education, but also trying to get them to understand that you have the potential to be the sub oppressor, because if you continue down this path that you're going down this humanitarian approach of, I just want to help people, you're going to step into communities and you are going to perpetuate and continue on those systems of oppression that lead people to be clients that need social workers. In some ways, you have to dismantle those very systems that, re that need social workers in communities. And so I'm hoping to try to get them to understand that before they get caught, swept up in an MSW program and go get their license and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it, there's, I think there's a long history to it. And it's a complex history, has a lot to do with this, this notion of professionalization you know, in this need of, of being a legitimate profession. But I think we lost the core of who we are, who we were, you know, and so you do see this side of radical social work. So there's a group called the Social Welfare Action Alliance, which is the kind of radical arm of the NASW. They're not a part of the NASW, but the National Association of Social Workers is our, you know, profession. That's our association. You have the Social Welfare Action Alliance, which is the more radical form and so i'm very upfront with students and like i come from a radical lens and this is what it is and i am that stereotypical leftist professor that they post on tiktok or whatever but that's my ethical responsibility <laughs> you know as a social worker that's 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 what you're stepping into and so you know that's welcome to social work 101 in my classes so um, yeah i I, you brought up Freire and we we're, we were going to anyway. Um, <laughs> Jump ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, how do you go about teaching this work in an academic setting, right? That is based on like the industrial model of schooling, right? The banking exactly. method of schooling. Uh, how do you teach this relationship driven work um, within inside of an academic institution where grades, yeah. uh, papers, all, all these things that people expect um, when they come into like uh, an academic program. How do you, how do you model that? It's, it's not easy. Uh, I think it depends on the environment you're in. I, I love the environment I am because I'm in an institution that historically was a woman's college, you know, um, primarily first generation college students. Um, it's in Greensboro. It, um, is the most diverse campus in the UNC system. Uh, Greensboro is an immigrant refugee re or it's a refugee re resettlement area. So we have a uh, higher rates of immigrant refugee populations, first generation college students, <clears throat> and, um, a pretty vocal and strong LGBTQ community. And that, you know, there is a certain expectation on campus that we are going to be a diverse, uh, we just had uh, Ben Shapiro come to our campus this past week. This has been a, you know, really challenging. And he came specifically, why would he come to UNC Greensboro? What, what, you know, he goes to Berkeley, he goes to other places. He came specifically because we have a pretty strong um, and vocal LGBTQ community here at UNC Greensboro. And so, you know, he came specifically for to, you know, denigrate transgender populations. And so our students were really upset and were protesting and stuff like that. So I think that it's a little bit easier, I, you know, than if I were in some other settings. Uh, I, you know, we have, I have colleagues that are very supportive. We now have a department chair who's, you know, we've, I've had in the iteration two department chairs. I'm not a tenure track faculty, I'm a contract person. So I can be laid off at any moment. And so I, I'm always navigating that in my head, understanding that in the environment that we're in. But, you know, department chairs who've also been very supportive and this is what we, this is our ethical responsibility. And so they will advocate for us. And so, you know, I've got a really good department chair who's advocating. And there's resistance among students. And the resistance is, and this is Henry Giroux talks, he wrote a book called Theory and Resistance in Education because when they're, ingrained in this banking model of education and as you see in the chapter they can walk into my classroom and all the desks 
are all to the side and they're we're set up in a circle and they're like what is this but i start to see them slowly kind of integrate this into their own thought process and there is still this expectation of grading and and frary talks about it and that you have to balance between you can't have you can't be authoritarian but you can't have complete license because if i were to just say okay we're going to throw all the tests and everything papers out the window, they're not going to show up. So for Freire, you have to balance this notion of authority and license. You have to allow, you can't just take people who are used to this oppressive educational system, this banking model of education. It's like, here, you're out there. We're going to do this because it, it's, it's too unnerving. It creates this cognitive dissonance. So I have to have a sign-in sheet for them to sign in. You have to be in class. There's an attendance policy. You need to show up. We're trying to build a community here. You're part of this community. You have agreed to come in. There's a paper you have to write. You have to demonstrate a certain level of understanding of the material, because if you're going to go into the community, I need to know that you understand these theories and how do you apply these theories and stuff. So there is a structure to it. Um, I just don't do it in the same structure that we have a test every day. We have our, you know, test every class period. And it's a complex test. I try to get them. And it's also fortunate in that I get them as juniors and seniors. So it's not like I have them as freshmen. <clears throat> so they have an understanding that there's a certain level of responsibility they, they have to do in the educational setting. But I try to get them to think in terms of being reflective practitioners. They've got to reflect on who they are and the work that they do. And part of my responsibility is to help you develop those skills. And I have to work with that discomfort. There's a lot of discomfort with it. And I have to work with that resistance. There's some resistance to it also. And um, that's, I think, where part of that educational process comes in. How are things going to happen? I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm part of a group of program directors who generally meet like once a semester because we have, I think, 23 undergraduate social programs throughout the state. And so we meet once a semester and I'm in part of the UNC system. And I've had colleagues who have been in other UNC institutions where they will do student events. And they said, well, we don't use the term social justice because, you know, we, we, it, it's just pejorative. For, it's somehow become a pejorative, you know, and I think that's part of the right wing pundits will use it. I'm like, well, we don't use the term social justice when we do student events. And I'm like, how it's our code of ethics. It's like the second one. How can you not? you know, hold an event that revolves around social justice and not use the term social justice. So I think there's a part of me, regardless of what happens to our, you know, I will probably lose my job at some point. I will go on and do something else. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it's like, I, I'm going to do this as long as I can. And I will, will, you know, and I fortunately I'm not in a system, you know, there's other UNC systems that are really struggling with this, but I'm fortunately right at this moment, not in a system we, we're dealing with financial issues and stuff like that but you know i'm still able to drag those desks out in the hallway put the students in a circle and you know do, do the best i can with what i have so <laughs> yeah i i really appreciate it in the chapter that you shared like the importance of creating that environment within the space because you know some people um you know and no judgment um will just like hey, let's turn these desks and face each other. Um, you're very intentional about like the space that you're curating. Um, why is that? Interesting, in the chapter, if you see the chapter online, if you can find it online, there's mm -hmm. photos in the chapter. With the uh, no moving the desks. Exactly, this. yeah. <laughs> yeah. This will, and that'll be linked for people in the show. Right, great, right, good. Yeah. yeah, and you know, when I was going back and forth, the editors like, I don't think we could do. It. I was like, it's not a big deal, and they did a great job. I, when I went back and read the reread the chapter, they did a really great job of describing the editor who was editing my chapter described it, and just a beautiful, like, oh wow, that was really poetic the way they described it. So yes, it's it's fascinating in that, um, and I have a couple of stories with this, you know, because I. A colleague of mine was teaching graduate students in social work, and he wanted me to come in and, and do a circle process with them. I was like, oh, yeah, I would love to. Yeah, whatever. So they're in the School of Ed, the School of Education, this new building, a school of education. Not all buildings are like this. They have some buildings are new or the chairs will move around. You know, they call them learning laboratories or whatever. Go in the School of Ed, and it's in a classroom. He didn't 
notice he's been teaching half the semester. And I'm like, these desks are bolted to the floor. We can't move them. What a great educational opportunity we have right now. Let me explain to you the banking model of education. <laughs> we'll do circle. It's engineered very specifically why these desks cannot be moved. And we had to huddle up in the front and do a circle process with the chairs because we couldn't move the desks in the school of ed, the same school of ed that I got my PhD from that taught me all these radical, crazy things in education. You know, it's so, so ironic. So um, I, you know, I, I don't think, I think it's, it's work. And there's a part of it that really, I appreciate the fact of it. You know, it's, some of it's frustrating, but I have, I do have to go into class 15 to 20 minutes before class and the desks are heavy and I have to move them and it takes me and I'm sweating by the time I'm done. And it's fascinating to see the different classes, how they will um, kind of buy into this because I will come in and students will have started to do this before I come in. That's the one I know that they're really starting to get it. Um, and so I think the intentional part is that, yes, it's oh, tired. I don't want to do it, but I, I keep falling back on this notion. It's like, I, yeah, I could have, I could lecture. I could pull up PowerPoints and I could lecture and it would just kind of be easier than moving these desks around. And then I have to end class a little bit early because I have to move them all back because that's the social construction of the classroom setting. That's why I posted those pictures. This is the way it's supposed to be. That's the right way, not sitting in a circle. That's the, that's the incorrect way. That's the, that's the way you're not supposed to do it. You know? So I have to put everything back in place in the correct configuration and stuff. So I have to end class a little bit early. So it cuts into this time of community building. But I, I think it, I, like I said, the, the value is the importance of human relationship. I can't lecture about that. Yeah, I just can't do it. I, it. Until somebody teaches me how to lecture on it where students will grasp it, it has to be a community building, relationship building process. And the only way that I know of right now to do that is for them to sit in a circle. We, not, we may not be doing a circle process like a traditional circle process where I have the centerpiece and stuff like that, but pretty much every class period I will start bringing in a talking piece with a check-in and a reminder of the community guidelines. We're still honoring the community guidelines and then have the talking piece go around and have students reflect on how they're doing. And sometimes we'll end the class like that. Yeah. And that's the, that's the relationship building part of that. So, How do you navigate? Uh, you, you mentioned that it does happen from time to time and I'm not asking you to name names or anything like that, but like, are there specific instances of initial resistance to this and how have people been ingratiated into um, being in that kind of learning environment? I think for the most part, students like the process. I think they get more frustrated in my um, informal grading <laughs> process. <laughs> sure. That's where they're more frustrated. And so I joke about like, well, I don't have tests, but then there are classes where I do have quizzes because, you know, they, it, they, it's on a canvas, it's on an online platform, they take the quiz and they see their grade and they know throughout the semester, this is my grade. And it seems to decrease the amount of anxiety. Um, I will do that in the fall semester with, with um, students. In the spring semester, I'm a little bit more resistant to that. And I will challenge them when they ask me how to write a reflection paper. I'm like, what are you really asking me? And then I get them to understand that what they're really asking me is, how do I make an A? How do I get an A? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then they kind of look at me like, but I, I actually love the resistance because that's where the dialogue comes in. And the resistance had been, has been having them read pedagogy. Of course, I have it next to me, having them read Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, and that's part of what I, I think my next paper I'm going to work on is trying to, the Cliff Notes version of this, but it's having students navigate this text and then getting in arguments with them in class about it. Because I had a student one time argue with me. It was, I just loved it. It was fantastic. He was like, you know, I had a friend of mine. I had to sit down with my friend and she had to sit with me and help me read this and understand these things. And I had, these, I had to talk to her about this. And I was like, that's fascinating. Would you have ever talked to her, had a dialogue with her about some of the concepts in this book if I had not assigned it to you? And he just looked at me like, you jerk. <laughs> because... No, he wouldn't have. And for, yeah. it, it was like this, boom, it's like, 
yes, that's what I'm expecting you to do. I'm expecting you to learn. That's why Ferry says that, you know, you will know this to some degree that it's a little kind of um, over the top, but he says learning is childbirth <laughs> for someone who had to go do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the point he's trying to make is it's not easy. And so, you know, I had students who come in, it's like, well, I just will skim a chapter before I come in. I've actually had to read this. Like, yes, that's, that's our values and ethics is confidence and integrity. <laughs> you know, you have to be confident. And so my expectation is that you will spend more than just skimming this. So the resistance has not been the circle process itself. Every now and then you'll get somebody who just doesn't like it and there's nothing mm -hmm. you can do about it. And that, and that's like, yeah, okay, that's, that's fine. And I tell them you have the right to pass, you know, understanding that this is supposed to be a consensus-based process and you're in a classroom setting, you're not being graded on us sharing. If you pass, and there will be students who will pass throughout the whole semester, that's their, that's their prerogative. They have the right to do that. And I have had students who will complain like, well, you know, I didn't like sitting in a circle because I didn't have anywhere to put my laptop or something like that. And so I could tell, well, you know, that's, that's fine because we're, we're trying to get into relationships and stuff. So the, the complaining more has been on the kind of informal grading process and really trying to get them to understand that learning is not about, you know, you placating me as the professor, but how do I learn and grow and be reflected? Um, I have had some interesting situations happened in circle, which I think has been fascinating, um, which I could share a couple of them. Um, with, with confidentiality in mind. And I'm thinking exactly. about, yeah, right. Uh, I'm thinking about the resistance that I anticipated was specifically students of the global majority coming in and talking about like the things that they've experienced in the front of a mixed audience or people from other marginalized backgrounds coming in. Uh, and I know like over the course of time, you are building relationships. You're not starting off with like, share your deepest, darkest trauma yeah. about the, the hard thing that happened. Like you scaffold up to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> those I, things. But there is like, I, I know in school settings that I've worked in, like students have learned in school that like, if I'm vulnerable, like I will get hurt. Yeah. 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 I, I think once again, I'm very fortunate in that um, first generation college students, we, we have a probably half more than half are African-American and we have some immigrant refugee populations are in that class and they come to that setting and I am I do have to be cautious with them because I'm the you know the white male professor who's sitting in that room right. and probably the only white male person in that room uh, and in some cases rarely there's a couple other white males who are in there sometimes men in there there's more men coming to it um but I think <laughs> you know I'm fortunate I am sitting in a in a space where um I am the minority and that they are able to, and I think this is what happens of being able to set them up in a circle because normally they would just, I would, regardless of who's in that classroom, if they're facing me, I'm it, you know? And so when I'm sitting in that circle with them, at first I'm it, but it slowly transitions away from me being it. It always, mm -hmm. I'm always it because I'm the professor. You can't, and I will, remind them that like, you know, I know that there's a power differential in here and that that's what we have to navigate through and that I want us to be a, as authentic as we can, but understand that, you know, and that's why I think I really have them grounded in the guidelines in the beginning, because the guidelines are really focused on this notion of being able to share what you feel comfortable sharing, respecting others. And so I'm always, and I, they kind of want to gloss over the guidelines a little bit in the beginning. And so I kind of reinforced with them as like, you know, if you were to go on and to do restorative justice practices and circle practices in communities, most likely you're going to be working with communities historically who have been marginalized, who don't have a voice. I know it's easy to kind of like, I agree to the guidelines, I agree to the guidelines, I go around and have them agree to the guidelines. And I, I kind of set them up a little bit because the confidentiality piece is one of them. I have the guidelines sitting in, in the middle and these little, cards that I've laminated so I can write on them. And there's like mm -hmm. eight of them or nine. Yeah. And so, and I could write other guidelines. And the last one is confidentiality. I keep that with me. And so I have them, I, I go over the guidelines. I talk about the guidelines, why the guidelines are important, why they're important for the setting. And I said, now we have to have consensus. We have to agree to these guidelines. So the talking piece is going to go around and you're going to 
indicate if you agree to the guidelines or if there's something about the guidelines you disagree with or if you think we need to add more to the guidelines. It generally goes around because they're still kind of now they're still getting orienting to this. I mean, it's still, mm -hmm. you know, so they're like, yeah, I agree to him. I agree to him. I agree to him. And it comes to me and I go, well, I just I disagree with the guidelines. I have some issue with the guidelines. And I'll look at me like you're the professor. What's wrong with you? And then I pull out the confidentiality card. It's like the only way that the setting can work is if we honor confidentiality. That is, we have a space where you can't walk outside this classroom and say, I can't believe what someone's have said in there, you know, because then you have violated the confidentiality within the setting. And so, but it also is for the first time, I think they're, they're facing each other and they're starting to see that I'm not the representative of social work. They are to large, hmm. you know, they're facing each other and it's a diverse population of people in there, you know, and it's otherwise it would just be facing me. And I think that that I'm hoping, I mean, I can't, I can only speculate, but I'm hoping that that starts to kind of sink in like, oh, wait a minute. I'm part of a broader community that is represented more than just this person who's teaching the class at this particular moment. You know, I'm, he may be the person responsible for this class, but I'm part of this broader spectrum of social workers who are sitting in this classroom right now. And we're all going to go into the community working together. And he's still going to be teaching this class later on, probably at some point. <clears throat> and so, so, you know, that is part of my hope is that I can't teach them about, I'm a white guy. How am I going to teach a group of students who are predominantly black about race? I can't, mm -hmm. you know, I can only teach it from my own perspective, but if I can get them to face each other and to hear their stories from each other, and that's where the stories slowly start to come out. And I, I do, I think that's a great, because the first question I usually start with, because they are asked, why do you want to be a social worker? And it's like to help people. I ask them, what brought you to social work? That's generally the first question. And at the yeah. very least, what it does is it puts them in a position to reflect on why they're sitting in the classroom right then at that particular moment. And it, and I share my story with them, you know, so I, I said, this is my story. This is what brought me to social work. And it starts to, I think, slowly open up this comfort level. And then the class itself has to kind of gauge. I love Kay's always when, you know, I've done circle trainings where she always says the circle does this, the circle does that. You know, people have asked her, like, why do you keep calling it the circle? You know, she's like, I have no control over it. And that's what I explain to students. I have no control over how this goes. Once the talking piece leaves my hand, that's it. You determine how you want this to go from here. And of course, you know, I'm the circle keeper and all these other things. But it, it really is a fascinating process to watch it. And I've yet to have felt like it's been unsuccessful. Like, oh, man, that just fell apart, you know, and the class just didn't get it and stuff like that my experience has been that they slowly start to share their own personal experiences. Those who feel comfortable and those who don't, don't share their personal experiences. And there's no judgment to it. Nobody sits there because I've been in classroom settings before I did a lot of circles where people would get really frustrated with, well, the people need to share more. And I'm like, well, you know, that I, I understand you want dialogue in here, but people need to share what they feel comfortable sharing. And, and but I haven't had that pushback in, in these kind of settings and stuff. So no, no, it's it's great. I, I appreciate it. I think about, you know, the need for this to be in like so many more spaces. Uh, social work education, definitely. So, I mean, we can just talk about that. Um, how do you hope that this kind of teaching, this kind of learning uh, grows? How have you seen it? Uh, how have you seen this practice grow in your spaces? Uh, what are you encouraged about? What are the barriers? That's a great, that's a great question. I, you know, I've, I think I've been more encouraged than not. I think the barriers of course are always going to be the system we're in, um, you know, and, and the policies and guidelines that are handed down and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I'm encouraged in the fact that I, what I have to, what I work with the students is I try to have them understand, help them understand that, you know, there's that retributive system. And so I really try to start that off in the beginning, like, you know, we have a retributive justice system. It's <clears throat> laws and crimes and punishment and attorneys and judges and police officers. We're not part of that. We, we are on the periphery of that system to some degree, but that's not the system we work in. 
we work in communities that are traumatized and have been harmed. And so we need to be restorative justice practitioners. I think I mentioned that earlier. And so that's slowly trying to get them ingrained to that understanding. Where I'm optimistic is that it's slowly starting to kind of move the needle with my colleagues a little bit. The students are great with it, I think, for the most part. I mean, there's always going to be some, but, you know, I think that in the beginning, there was this kind of, you know, oh, he's the flaky mindfulness, you know, peace, because I call them peacemaking circles, very specific Mm -hmm. that I call them peacemaking circles. And I explain to the students why I call them peacemaking circles and that you can call them anything, you know, community building circle, whatever. But my hope is that as social workers, we go into communities and we're peace builders and peacemakers. So I call in these peacemaking circles. So I'm trying to reinforce some of the language with them. And so my colleagues, and it's, it's tongue in cheek, you know, we're, we always chide each other and pick on each other, you know, is the flaky peace person and the flaky mindfulness person. I'm like, yeah, but you know, mindfulness is ubiquitous in cognitive behavioral therapy and they all want to be therapists. So why would we not be doing mindfulness in class, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. as a technique, not only for them because they have to teach it, but because they need it for themselves. And there is a chapter on mindfulness and trauma. I don't know if I re- referenced it in that, in that, um, in my chapter or not, where at the end of the chapter and I assigned it to students, it says, you know, it's kind of like riding a bicycle. You can try to tell somebody how to do it, but you need to know how to do it or driving a car. You need to know how to do it. <clears throat> and so, you know, I start every class period with a moment of mindfulness or reinforce mindfulness throughout the class period. And so, you know, my colleagues have kind of joked about it. But by the time they get into some of them in the graduate program, it's it's not unfamiliar to them. And it's I'm just kind of stunned with the disconnect sometimes with our my colleagues as professionals who talk about mindfulness and not understand that this is a lived practice. <laughs> you know, it's not a just a technique that you just teach people. You have to do this technique yourself. And I think that that's <clears throat> part of what's happening with the restorative justice piece, because I'm going back up to Eastern Mennonite taking a course the summer, summer peace building Institute on forgiveness and reconciliation and this trauma uh, strategies for trauma awareness and resilience training. And I'm very open in our meetings. I'm doing this. These are graduate level courses. <clears throat> I bring these back and I'm integrating them into our undergraduate curriculum. And I want our undergraduate curriculum to be more trauma informed because our social work students are going into the communities that are traumatized and they need to be equipped to deal with trauma. And that's why I'm doing this. And slowly, so we just had a meeting today and I was like, and I want to come back in the fall and I want to share with my colleagues what I learned at Eastern Mennonite. And I want us to think about what can we take from this and apply to our graduate program. And we have a doctoral program and how can we apply some of this to our doctoral program right now? So I'm optimistic in that I'm starting to see colleagues who probably historically have been grounded in this hyper-professional model of social work to understand that this is a broader perspective and that we do need to utilize these other techniques or tools or however we want to define them to be really effective in what we do and that social work we really do need to be restorative justice practitioners in communities that's kind of our ethical responsibility Um, so I think that's part of my optimistic hope is that I, you know, we're seeing some change in, in some of the colleagues that I work with. And as I slowly start to work with doctoral, doctoral students, it's once again, my indoctrination. I'm going to indoctrinate the doctoral students because they're the ones that are going to go out and be teaching undergraduate students, um, you know, future undergraduate students after I'm gone and retired or moved on to something else and stuff. Did that answer the question? Or <laughs> yeah. And I think like the, the thing that I wanted, one of the things I want to pick out from there it's like you know you have to you were talking about it in the framework of mindfulness but you have to practice it in order to teach it um you have to practice restorative justice you have to practice living in the circle way you have to practice being a peacemaker in order to teach it right it's not just like oh hey i read this chapter in this book about how to set up a circle got it we're good (laughs) um how I think I'll frame it like this. How are you inviting your colleagues um, and others, like your colleagues that you work with mm. at Greensboro, but but others um, into uh, learning, embodying this 
uh, this engaged pedagogy, yeah. if you will. Yeah, is, yeah it is. Uh, that's it. <laughs> so, you know, we're coming out of the pandemic. And so one of the things that I think my colleagues have had to see, and I've got wonderful colleagues, there's no doubt about that. But one of the things that they've seen over the past year <clears throat> is the trauma our students are experiencing, <laughs> you know, coming, being a student in the pandemic, and that we're going to have <clears throat> students coming to us who've experienced trauma, you know, because we once again, have a high rate of first generation college students. And we have students who are coming from the very marginalized groups that, you know, we want social workers to go and try to work with and change those systems. And so they're coming in embodying this trauma. And I think that what is starting to click for them is I was, I was talking about in our meeting today is like, not only do I want to come back, integrate it into the curriculum, present it to you, but I also want us to start doing maybe some trauma circles with students outside of the classroom. You know, it's easy to some degree to have to teach this to students in the classroom. You know, what are we doing for students outside the classroom to help them deal with their own trauma and the, the, the suffering that they've been experiencing? That's a different, that's a different mindset that we have to, to take on. And I think that that's what I, I'm starting to see when I talk about that. Like, yeah, we really need to do this. And the, my department chair is like, yeah, we, yeah, this is, we've got to figure out how to start doing this with students outside the classroom because we're going to have students who really come with a lot of pain and trauma and stuff. And so I, the pandemic has caused a lot of issues. My colleague who's in peace and conflict studies now, we're, we were doing circle process once a month. Um, for a community. We were doing it for community mm -hmm. um, before the pandemic. And I have told him, I was like, we, we really need to get back into doing this. Um, and it's interesting in that we had a handful of people who were coming to it, um, but to, to broaden out our, our goal with what we were doing, I think he named it like circles of pedagogy and practice or something like that, is that we were, um, I think my chapter was circles of pedagogy. So he called it circles of practice or something. He used some term for it. And we were, um, we'd have a handful of people and they were coming there and they're like, well, we thought this was a training. It's like, no, nah, we're doing circles. We're trying to have a community come in where we do circles. We're not really trying to train people. Um, but the, the thing we're hearing from people is like, we want some kind of training. So like, okay, well, we'll do a, and I, by all means, this is not a circle training. I mean, you need to do more than a day. It was like, well, we'll do it like an eight hour day where we'll go over the fundamentals of circles. And, but our hope is that you continue to come back to our circle and you start to indicate, I'm going to be the circle keeper this next month. You're like, I want to do that. And that it's not just this, you go through the eight hour training and now I'm a circle practitioner and go out into the community and do this. It's that we're trying to get this practice out to the community and trying to introduce this to the community. And then hopefully community members will say, I really need to learn how to do this. And these are the different areas I can go to learn how to do this. And that here are some people in the community who've been doing this for a while. And I want to work with them because we would tell them like, we will work with you if you want to do something like this, where we can come in and help you kind of get set up, hold on a second, get set up and we can come in and do this process with you and help you get oriented to this process. So part of what we were trying to do is just to educate people and get this knowledge base out there and get people to, to start reading at the very beginning and to start thinking like, well, where can I find another training that's like a three-day training or how can I do this where I just practice the skill or I keep coming back to their monthly circle and say, well, I want to be a circle keeper this month and just practice a little bit. And so that's part of what my hope is as far as getting this out into the community to some degree and seeing my colleagues kind of support that, which initially they were just like, ah, oh, yeah, this is kind of flaky, but you know, <laughs> but I think they've, they've understood seeing our students come back embodying that trauma that that trauma is in the community and we've got to come up with ways and practices to deal with the trauma within the community also and it's part of our responsibility as a community-based university that we are doing these practices within communities that's beautiful like it's not some 
um daniel the person does not just exist within the realm of like unc green yeah. Co- bro <laughs> school of social work like there are other ways that like you have embodied this work that's impacted your life um, we've talked a lot about you're know, the professional but what are some of those ways you know you kind of just talked about like into the community but how has this way of being impacted your personal life um that's a that's another great question um you know I, that's hard to really describe i I think it's impacted my personal life in that I don't want to get too flaky. I mean, there's certain levels of meaning that's given me, you know, like <clears throat> I'm the type of person, there's always this joke, like, well, you know, ask a person who they are without asking what they do, what their job is. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, but this is my job. <laughs> you know, like I said, if I lose the job at the university, I'm still going to be doing this. I may not be teaching this in a classroom setting, but I'm still going to be doing it to some degree. And so it's impacted my life, I think, in that I came to social work because I needed, it's like a calling when I try to talk to students about this idea of, of um, uh, the term is uh, escaping me right now, but um, where you uh, embody and you think about and you reflect on your, your practice. Um, there's a, it's a religious term. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Okay. Discernment where you discern, you have to discern this, you know, you've got to really reflect and discern on this, who, who you are. And so, you know, people ask me like, how did you go from the military to social work? You know, I'm like, well, you know, I was 18 and what I was taught about the military is you're doing something that's greater than you. Like, you know, I, so it's not a huge stretch. Um, I may not agree with the system, but the, how they, connect people to it is because they want to do things that are greater than themselves, be part of something that's greater than themselves. So that, you know, that's how I got to social works. Like I, I, I can't just sit by and see communities unfold as they have, you know, I've got to do something to help it. And I think part of it's my own background of growing up in the rural South and seeing just how racist and, you know, how hateful it can be, but that there's also beauty within how people try to change these systems down here, you know, and what people were willing to sacrifice to change these systems, or at least try to, to some degree. And so, you know, it, it has impacted me in that as I've come to social work, because I felt this need and this calling to be a social worker, restorative justice has given me that foundation, that groundwork of, okay, this is how I want it to look like, you know, yes, social workers can go in and they can harm communities. And I play this documentary for some of my classes called Dawnland. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's mm-hmm. about, it's an it's incredible documentary. It's about a truth and reconciliation process up in Maine. It's the oh, first okay. state supported truth and reconciliation process. Like we had one here in Greensboro and it revolved around child welfare, removing first nations children from their family. Mm all the way up into the 2000s. Yeah. And it is about the harm that social workers have done in communities, you know? And so I play that to students. I'm like, if we are not reflecting on the power that we have in communities, we may look like the community that we go into. And that can sometimes give us this salt, this uh, false sense of like, oh, I look like this community. So I, there's no way that I will be reinforcing levels of oppression that's the fairy sub oppressor if we're not reflecting on that then we will be causing more harm and damage and so that it's given me this this idea of like yes this is how i can be a social worker in the community and constantly evaluate and reevaluate my own power differential my own power structure who i am who i embody when i walk into vulnerable communities and that that positionality that I hold when I go into communities, which is very powerful. And I have to be you know, aware of that. So how can I continue to work with communities and not be the white savior or be the sub oppressor or be even the oppressor, you know? And that's really important to me to understand that and to reflect on that on a daily basis. So that's how it's impacted me. It's, it's put me in a position to look at some really uncomfortable biases within myself that a lot of people who embody what I look like and where I come from don't want to see and to constantly interrogate that and to 
sometimes, and this is, I think, part of where the apology comes from, because sometimes I have to shut up and listen to somebody else. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I have a, I have my department chair is this, like, I keep going back to her. She's this wonderful person because I use this experience with her one time where we were sitting together and I said something and she corrected me. And I was remembering how I felt in that particular moment. And if I had not practiced these mindfulness skills, because I talked to her about this and she goes, that she's like, I'm so glad you recognize that. I said, you are not correcting me out of a position of frustration, but out of a position of love and care. You know, that's like, I said something and you needed to correct me on, on my bias. And my first reaction is like, oh God, you know, like that's painful and to be defensive. And it, I had to catch that and say, I really appreciate that she cares enough about me because she could have just let it go. <laughs> mm -hmm. She cares enough about me to say, and that's because we have a really close relationship. That she cares enough about me to say, not that you're wrong, but to gently correct me on that. And it came from a position. Well, that's what Bell Hooks talks about. You know, it's this, and both Ferry talk about, you know, that we have to come from this, from this position of love. And so, you know, that's, that's what it's given me personally is this, hopefully this ability to, to maybe shut up sometimes and listen to people. So this is, this is an odd, this is kind of an odd position for me because I'm talking, 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 you know, I'm trying to I was gonna say, yeah, this is a podcast. Yeah, I know. And I'm like, this, this isn't wrong. the Quaker meeting yeah. where we're just having people just yeah, sit in silence, <laughs> wait for the thing. Yeah. This, this awesome. is what you're wanting for me. And I, but I, and this is why I like doing circles in class because I have to shut up. I have to listen to students and I have to watch that talking piece go around and I have to be aware and observant how often and that's a gift how often does a professor who teaches students have an opportunity to listen to students stories and lived experiences mm -hmm. you know how, that hardly ever happens that's a gift yeah. and so you know i talk about trying to indoctrinate students there's a selfish component to it's a gift to me that i'm mm -hmm. able to sit in a space with a very diverse group of people and listen to their stories and stuff. And I, you know, I, I have to do it. I, I, I could not imagine doing anything else, but doing circles with students. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I want to transition us into the questions that everyone answers when they come on to this podcast. And we kind of touched on some of these, but uh, I'm curious in your own words to find restorative justice. I've, I, cause I think I have thought about it. I do have the textbook version cause I have to teach it, you know, and it's, it's mm -hmm. there. But to me, it is a way of life that we have to engage in that's going to bring about a certain level of um, understanding of how we connect with each other as people. It is something that we are need for community building. And it is something that we need as a group, I, I, not to get too into the textbook, but I think that we have mm -hmm. a lot of, of harms that have happened, of course, just based on how this country is structured that we've never addressed, that we've never dealt with. And I think it's damaging from my perspective as a white cisgendered male that we've never dealt with it. It continues to cause harm to me and it causes harm to the communities that have historically been harmed from it. And the only way that we can start to work towards any type of community building is to engage in restorative justice practices and that we have to see that there's got to be a different way that we live on this planet that is a lot more uh, peaceful and equitable and just and humane, um, <clears throat> that we see people as more than just dollar signs or more than, you know, the the talking piece, the, the thing about the chapter is I, I use the beads and I, mm -hmm. now I use a bowl and it, I think, uh, I don't remember if I had the bowl. I think I had the bowl. I don't know if you remember it. It was a bowl that was broken and I glued it back. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the, the bowl. That's what I use as the talking piece for the most part, which is very profound. And I, I try to explain to students like we are a sum total of who we are damaged are not most of us are, are damaged pretty damaged yeah can you explain that bowl i <laughs> i know what it is um oh because yeah. i've seen it uh yeah so it's a 
and the story that goes with it is I, I had a, a bowl that I bought at TJ Maxx. I love, because I have the bowl go around. I have students try to describe the bowl. And they're like, it's a bowl, it's a bowl, whatever. And then I explained to him, I was like, you know, I, it's a bowl that I bought at TJ Maxx. It's just a little bowl, has dragonflies on it. And I'm clumsy and I'm also hard on myself. So I broke the bowl and I got really angry and I pulled the trash can out of the sink and I threw the pieces into the trash can. And I was sitting there looking at it and I was like, I, I think I was more frustrated. It's like, I get so angry at myself so quickly. You know, I was like, I'm so clumsy. I'm so clumsy. Like, yeah, you're clumsy. You get over it. That's just the way you are. And so I looked at it and I thought about how quickly you are to discard things. And then I remembered the practice of the Kintsuji, which is this Japanese practice where they put broken things, usually it's pottery back together using gold and mm -hmm. lacquer. And it makes a piece of art, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the gold highlights the cracks and the broken pieces. <clears throat> and so I explain it to students and it has been a profound talking piece because I've worked, I've used it in community circles also, especially working in, uh, I worked in a men's shelter for a little bit using it, talking about how we're damaged and we put ourselves back together and that, you know, we're, we evolve into something different. It could be a piece of art and it has been a profound piece for people and that they I think that that probably more than anything else really connects students to that process because I think that we want to hide how we're broken and I'm sitting there using this bowl as a metaphor and I sit there like I'm broken. That's it. My brokenness is that I will get mad at myself being clumsy and, you know, throw things away and people are easily discarded in society. That's what we do with people who are broken. We want to discard them because they serve no purpose anymore and our role as social workers is that we have to help figure out how to put ourselves back together and, you know, help people put themselves back together. And so that's the, the metaphor of the bowl. And so um, <clears throat> I think that that's kind of where I come from in relation to, I'm trying to remember the question now. <laughs> Define restorative justice in your own words. Yeah. So that's restorative justice. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so bad. I want to trail off. So, but I think that is what restorative justice is, is that we're looking at a system that's broken, you know, a, a, a system of justice is broken, a system of how we educate people that's broken, a system of how we deal with people who are harmed and traumatized that is broken. And we have to figure out how to put it back together. And I think that that's what restorative justice is. And that it was how the book evolved was, is it a discipline or is it, is it a profession or is it a way of living? I think that was kind of the, when I came up with a chapter was at a restorative justice conference, conference East Men, Eastern Mennonite. It was about, mm -hmm. is it a profession or is it a way of life? And I think it is a way of life. I mean, my concern is we can codify it like we did social work certify it, credential it, license it, and then I'm a licensed restorative justice practitioner. And then you're going to follow that kind of same trajectory that social work has followed to a large degree. And so there's some resistance from me. Like I've already got a credential. I don't need another one. I've already got a license. I don't need another one. I'll go to these trainings, but I don't need the credentialing. And that this is kind of what it offers us and that it's a hopeful way of life and that we start to look at the damage and harm that have happened in communities and how how do we work at changing that? I don't want to say fixing it. Fixing is kind of, you know, I don't know if it's letter rock or I'm trying to, it was a piece act, a piece author, peace and um, peace and conflict studies author. And he said that healing is in direct response to harm. And so this is when I talk about Dawn land, they were talking about the truth and reconciliation process and the native population said, you know, you, you want to get to reconciliation. We're still in dealing with truth. So we should have just called this a truth process. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know if it's the letter rock, but he, he was saying that <clears throat> healing is in, de in direct response to harm. So when you look at structural racism, slavery, you know, 400 years, healing at a minimum is 400 years, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and we don't want to hear that because that's beyond my capacity to understand. 400 years down the road, but how are we going to get that unless we start that process of healing, you know, less as a community, we start that. And we have to understand that reconciliation is a privilege that I may not know. The truth and getting to that process is what I, is the work that I may have to do. And I have to understand that that's, 
that's going to happen years down the road that I may not get to see that outcome. You know, mm-hmm. I have to do be part of the process. And we always hear about process as part of that stuff. Instead yeah. Of things, so. Yeah. Um, as you've been doing this work over the last, you know, couple of decades, uh, and, and I think there's a K question, what's been an oh shit moment as you've been practicing and what did you learn from it? Uh, <laughs> I loved her question. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, I, there's been many. I think that um, the, the, the oh shit moment I had in doing circle in class, this was a great one, I think, in that I was doing a circle with a class and I have a tendency, I, because what will happen when I'm doing circles is students will look and answer me. I'll have, you know, I'll pose something in the talk piece of ground. So sometimes I will have a tendency to look down and I try to do that because I'm not trying to ignore them. I'm trying to get them to understand that, you know, I'm, <clears throat> if I'm sitting there, they have a tendency just to talk to me and I want them to talk to the circle. And so I'm, I'm sitting there and there's a person next to me and the talking piece goes to the person that goes around. All of a sudden the person next to me starts to, I would say yell, but is pretty assertive with the person across the way. And it was like, oh shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like she doesn't have the talking piece and now she's confronting the person on the other end of the circle. And so I had to stop. <clears throat> and it's one of those moments that you just can't replicate in an educational setting where it was like, okay, I can just shut this down. This is it. We're done. You know, we have, we're not going to have circling more classes over. That's it. And I was like, I can't do that as uncomfortable as I am right now. This is a learning experience and this is what the circle is about. So I went and got the talking piece. I brought it back to me. I said, okay, just to remind everyone, we have the guidelines in front of us honor the talking piece. You know, I went through the guidelines again. We agreed to the guidelines. This is, we have a conflict in the circle. This is now a conflict circle and we are all part of this conflict. And so now we all need to address the conflict that's, that's come up because of the circle or what that's come up because of this. And so we use this as an opportunity to process the conflict that came up in this moment. So it was kind of like, I think an oh shit moment in the moment, like, oh, wow, this is getting ready to fall apart. And so how I respond to this is really important and that I need to be mindful and observant of where everybody is and to bring everybody back to the kind of center. And that this is where the kind of tough work of this really happens. You know, this is the kind of, you know, that I think that's the kind of oh shit moment in the moment where like I could respond to this. I think the oh shit moment that has been frustrating for me is I forget sometimes that when I do this in communities, this is a completely different story. When I do this, so you can choose one of the two, I guess, or both. When I do this in communities, um, that I need to be very clear with the community I'm working with, what I'm bringing and what is going to happen, if that makes sense. That, yeah so people don't think it's some voodoo well, <laughs> ritual that, going on in the yeah that and also i think you know i have to be cautious not to be the authoritarian but mm-hmm. that there is a structure to this and that my expectation like i i've learned that i won't go into a community unless like um if they want me to come in and do a circle i will talk to a group of people first and say this is what this is going to look like you need to make sure people are on board with it if you need me to talk about it beforehand, I will. If you need me to talk about the structure a little bit to give an orientation of it, I will. But, you know, I don't want people to feel like I have to come to this. And mm-hmm. I also need for you to honor and respect me in that I'm going to carve out a certain amount of time that we're going to do this in. And this is the expectations I have. Like, I don't want surprise. I don't want to step into surprises. I know that surprises will come up. If a conflict comes up, I'm willing to, to deal with that. And the reason I say this, I had a situation where, and this is where I've, I had to remind myself that just because I know a person doesn't mean I have to, that I, I, that I can't be clear. I need to be clear with that person. And so I had a person want me to come in that I knew really well to do a circle process with a community group. And I was like, okay, well this, you know, just understand at least an hour and a half and it was working with different community members who had different uh, intellectual capacity is the best way to put it. And I said, 
I really want to focus on working with the people who are staff right now in the beginning, um, because I, this is this is where most of the issue is coming from. And so the residents, you know, I, I don't want them to be a part of this yet. If you want me to work with the residents, we'll do that. But that's a different conversation because what you're telling me is this is what we need to focus on. So I'm going to work with the staff first. And if you want me to work with residents, I'll do that. But when I come in, I want to work with staff and then we have an hour and a half. And I started to get some like texts like, well, there's a conflict. Don't bring that up. And I'm like, that's not that's not how this works. And so when I came in, <clears throat> um, the person was like, oh, we only have an hour. I was like, well, no, we already negotiated an hour and a half. And then residents started to come in to the circle and I wasn't prepared for that. And it reminded, that was the oh shit moment where it's like, regardless of whatever group I'm working with, I need to be very clear what this process is, what the expectations are, what your expectations are and what my expectations are when we come to this and that you don't change that before I come in because that changes the dynamics of it. And if you have certain things that need to be addressed and you bring other people in, that's gonna create some issues as far as how this thing is structured. Does that make sense, I guess? Yeah, yeah, I think it reminds me of, uh, I think it was, I'm, I'm forgetting which episode it was, but someone also talked about, you know, somebody running a community circle and then like inviting someone um, who is coming like just like oh what's this yeah. can i be a part of this right and as much as like we want to be open welcoming and inclusive like mm -hmm. that changes what that circle is then mm -hmm. right yeah <clears throat> yeah it's it's a very much i think that and i think that's something we have to remind ourselves as restorative justice practitioners in that yes this is a way of life but there it is somewhat of a profession and there are some guidelines that we follow there is an ethical and moral obligation that we have with the community we work with and that we need to be clear with the community we work with. I've done circles where the press has walked in and I'm like, no, you know, you can't just sit and watch this. You are going to be a part of the circle, which is confidentiality, which means you can't report on this or you have to leave. And the, you know, the reporter left, which is fine. But I think that that's what we have to remind ourselves is that when we step into vulnerable communities, we have to be aware that we bring in a certain amount of weight that comes with that. And we have to make sure that nothing, I mean, we can't help people's traumas are gonna come up, but we have to make sure that we're clear with what we're coming into and also clear that we'd have no control over it. If a conflict comes up, a conflict comes up, I can't stop that. But that's mm -hmm. the clarity of it is like, I'm not here to contort this to meet your agenda. You know, I'm, I have guidelines for very specific reasons and that's to hold this space in a certain way and to ensure that people feel safe and that they can share. And if I don't honor those within myself and within the community and start to tinker with those things to meet a person's agenda, it's not going to work. It's going to start to dissolve, you know, and that's an oh shit moment for me as I've done more community work is that I need to be very clear up front. This is what we're doing. This is how it's going to look. So there's no surprises. There'll be surprises, you know, the, but this is, you know, and, and don't, don't come to me and say, you know, I want you to do this and then kind of like sideline me with like, Oh, but don't do this part of it now. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Like eh, that's, that's, there's some, insincerity why you're asking me to come then you know i yeah i want to i want to be authentic with the group i'm working with and stuff so that's that's my yeah. moment. so there's the, the old shit moment in the moment when like oh shit this is just getting ready to go down in that class you know and then there was the mm -hmm. shit moment where i've learned like this is how i need to work with communities when i'm, I'm doing this process and and ensuring that people are safe so mm -hmm. yeah um you get to sit in circle with four people living or dead who are they oh. and what is the one question you ask the circle oh man oh four people living or dead oh man that's a fantastic question emma goldman <laughs> oh that would be such a crazy circle sorry who's emma goldman uh emma goldman was a uh, anarchist feminist anarchist in the late 19 19th early 20th century um okay yeah, and so uh, labor activist, 
um, and uh, anarchist in was um, deported because of her being outspoken of World War One. Oh, amazing! Yeah, Emma Goldman is amazing uh, individual. So um, <clears throat> I think I would be curious, given the recent things with Hannah Hannah is it Hannah Nicole Jones of the sixteen nineteen? Mm-hmm. I would love to have her be part of that circle just because of what's happened with the UNC system and just to be able to be in circle with her and talk to her about that. So I have to pick one more, don't I? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that's a great question. Who would I pick? I, oh, I think K. <laughs> sure. I need somebody to help me with that circle. <laughs> sure. And then what is the one question you ask that circle. Oh, okay, for this, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, Bayard Rustin, and Emma Goldman. I don't even know. I, it would have to be something to get them to reflect on their own personal lived experiences. I, I'm trying to think of the question. Of course, you know, mine is like, what brought you to social work? I think it would have to be something related to, you know, <clears throat> what brought you to do what you're doing today. You know, and I know that's a broad. That's such a broad question, but I think it would be something where I really want to hear their personal experiences, what brought them at that particular moment. Um, you know, what was the defining moment that led you on the path to where you are today? Like what, what for you was that like, Oh, this is what I've got to do. You know, this is where I've got to go. This is where my life, this is the trajectory that my life has to go in and stuff. I I know that's, I know it's kind of a cop out for question, but, um, well, well, let's see how you feel about it when I turn it back to you. Oh, because God. you know you've talked about all of these, all of these influences. But like, what is there a moment that stands out to you? Yes, there is actually. I think that um, the first Gulf War was the moment that stood out for me. Um, I was in the Army Reserves. I had been in the military. I was a drill instructor in the Army Reserves. I was trying to complete my associate's degree in criminal justice, and um, was going through law enforcement training and the first Gulf War happened and I was getting ready <clears throat> to be activated to train that we were unsure what was going to happen. And it was going to be to train what are called inactive is what is often called the backdoor draft. And it's inactive reservists who have left the military. So when you sign up for the military, you have an eight year obligation. I, when I was there. So you may be in the army for two, four years, but then you're obligated for the remainder of times what's called inactive reserves. And my responsibility, if I got activated, was to train inactive reservists to go fight in a war. And that was the first time because, you know, I had gone in the military with this understanding like, oh, I may have to go fight in a war. But that was the first time that it was like, I may actually have to train somebody else to do something that I fundamentally have an issue with that I've never questioned within myself before. And now I'm faced with this prospect. That was probably the defining moment. That was the existential moment for me where I was like, I can't do this, what I'm doing anymore. I've got to do something else. Placed me in this position of reflecting on who I was, who I had become at that point was not who I was, who I am. And how did I get to that point? There was a very engineered, structured way, and I write about this in my dissertation, it was a very engineered, structured way to ensure that somebody like me, who's kind of like lost and <clears throat> barely graduated high school and didn't have no, you know, didn't have like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, here, we'll put you right here. <laughs> and so it was a very engineered, structured way to put me in this position. And for the first time, I was really faced with that existential point. And that was for me like, oh, wow, I can't do this. I need to reintroduce myself to the person I was. You know, we joke about the inner child and stuff like that. But I literally had to reintroduce myself to the person I was like 10, 12 years old. And how that trajectory split from where it went and where it could have gone and how I had to reorient myself. Cause I don't say like, I, you know, like we talk about it, like restorative justice, is not something that I came to, it's something I came back to. And so how did I reorient myself to the person that I was 
and understand that I don't regret the person I had become at that point. You know, I, I those were important experiences in my life and I, I don't, you know, wouldn't necessarily change them, but that was a defining moment for me where I was like, I, I have to reflect on who I am and what my choices are and where, what my choices are going to be from here on out. And so, um, that was the defining moment for me. Yeah. I don't tell many people that though. That's interesting. I will, I will talk about it in class. Um, and so I wish that I talked about it more. I will talk about it sometimes. Um, but it's funny because I, I, I will talk about it in a very kind of compressed version. I remember a student one time said, I think there's more to that story than you're telling us right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what it begs for me is like, how long after that moment did it take you to like step out? Um, it took a while. It was a very painful process. Um, and I appreciate the pain that I went through. And I, had, I got into counseling. Um, and this is why I love education, because I came to UNCG as an undergraduate student. And, you know, it was a quirky, small state liberal arts college at the time. And so this was a completely different world for me. You know, I came from the military and here I'm walking in and the joke and they still use it is they call it UNC gay, because historically that's what it's been. You know, it's been a, a university that's attracted LGBTQ communities, but it's attracted artists and um you know, and it's moved away from that a little bit. I think it still has it to some degree, but it's gotten bigger with graduate programs and stuff like that. But I think it's still kind of there at its core to some degree. And it was just an amazing experience to step into that environment and be like, wow, this is, this is amazing. This is to be in a world that is so unfamiliar to me and to have students that were a little bit younger than me because it was a little bit older, non-traditional students who were really patient with me as I tried to learn and grow personally and, and get into counseling. And I think that's why I came to community, doing community mental health, but also my own personal journey. So it, it took, I would say it was, it took a couple of years. It was a pretty, I, it did and it didn't. There was a relatively quick process and a snap and, and like, yeah, you, you're, this is not what you're supposed to be. You've really kind of BS'd yourself for several years and you held it together. <laughs> you know, with some duct tape and stuff, but this is not who you are. So I think there was a little bit of kind of like, wow, you know, like I've finally figured out, you know, here's the person that, not that I knew exactly, but this is the person that I, I really need to be. And instead of trying to BS it and pretend to be something I'm not, which I think was in some ways harder to do, but that process was also pretty painful in that you, you reflect on, wow, there's some choices I could have made. And so I, I needed some counseling to help navigate through that process. And it was really grateful, you know, and it wasn't just counseling. It was, uh, you know, the people I was around at the time and <clears throat> people who were, who were patient and willing to work with me and stuff like that. And so um, it was a journey. And I think that's what's attracted me to ideas like restorative justice, which is a journey, you know, and process mm -hmm. as opposed to outcome and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I like there, there's a deeper story like that, that student said, and I'm, I'm grateful that you shared it here in this space. Um, this one I hope is a little bit shorter. Um, you know, what is one thing, a mantra or affirmation that you want everyone listening the hundreds right now, maybe thousands and millions later, <laughs> yeah. what's one thing that you want everybody to know walking away from our conversation today? Um, Oh gosh, you ask such hard questions. I don't know. <laughs> You're so great at this. I, you know, I, that's a good one. I think that, um, the, the one that I work with the students and I think the one that I will try to work with people is that we do get caught up in outcomes and productivity, you know, like I've got to have this. And so what I, the mantra I try to reinforce is the process and the journey, the process and the journey, you know, that's the important part of it. Uh, and so I, I like the language because I joke with students like, you know, you write your notes on a progress note because that is to denote that there's some sort of progress. We don't write it on any regress note. God forbid if we were to regress, but that's where some of the, you know, inner work and the, the growth comes from is our ability to regress to some degree. Mm -hmm. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, the, to, to get students to understand because they're so caught up in 
this is the end goal. This is what I want. And a lot of times they will miss such amazing opportunities that will come in front of them because they're looking at that one point that's down the road right there. And I think that that, what was able to help me when I went through that existential crisis was that I don't know what to do now. This was my life. This is what I had done. My whole life had been mapped out with what I was going to do. There was different areas I could have gone and now it's completely upended. And I tried to embrace that. And because of that, these amazing opportunities came up before me. And I've done things that I would have never done. I've traveled places that I would have never traveled. I've met people that I would have never met and experienced things I would never experience. If I had not just stepped back and said, just kind of enjoy this journey mm-hmm. and be in the moment and let the process happen, as opposed to, I've got to have this end point. I've got to get this license or this degree or this whatever completed and done and stuff. And I joke that, you know, I, I did my PhD because it was an excuse for me not to work full time for about four years, you know, but in it, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but it, it was, it was like, you know, it was a pro because I wanted, I wanted, I didn't want to be in a traditional education setting where it's like here, you got to do, you know, quantitative research analysis and X, Y, and Z, and you have X number of articles published. I wanted to be in a space where I sat in the classroom and I had a great professor. It's like, this class is not going to get you a job. <laughs> mm-hmm that's what I needed. And that's, I think that that's, I, there's resistance I get from students sometimes when I try to explain it to them, because yes, they want, they need a degree. They want to get the degree because this is what they want to do. And I understand that, but don't get so caught up in, I've got to be done. And this is the end goal. Enjoy that moment. Enjoy that process and, and allow yourself to make these mistakes and to stumble and mess up and get broken and, fixed and rebroken and refixed and stuff like that, you know, just try to embrace it for what it is. Cornell West does a great job. If you ever get a chance to see his, um, the documentary called the examined life, he's talking about democracy and he's, he's a philosopher, you know, of course, just eloquent philosopher, just can describe things I could never, he's describing democracy as beautiful, messy, you know, and this is kind of what it is. And, and I think that that's kind of how life is to some degree. It's just this messy process and we want to kind of make it nice and neat. And it's just not going to work like that. Um, and we have to kind of sometimes embrace that messiness and that, you know, those mistakes and allow us to be broken and, oh, there's a, there's a piece of me laying over there. <laughs> Let me go pick it up. <laughs> I knew it was there somewhere. <laughs> This one requires a little bit of homework from you. Oh. Um, who's one person that should have on the podcast? And you have to help connect us. Have you inter- You've interviewed John Powell, right? I have not. So um, I'm trying to think of people for you to interview that have worked within some of the circles I've worked in. There's a couple, uh, Val Hansen and John Powell. And so, um, I, so you ask for one, I get yeah. stressed and I give you two. Beautiful. Um, so um, Val would probably be a little bit more resistant. She's amazing, but she's introverted like me. <laughs> so she made you. John is interesting. He he um, he was probably in the circle you were in. I'm trying to remember if he was. Or yeah, he was there. Yeah. He was there. And you know, does circle process and, and death row. And um, I I think he's amazing to bring into spaces down here in the south where you will have some resistance of things like restorative justice and circle process and he can step in some of those spaces where i can't step into you know because i just i i don't think that i could he could he can bring connections together in ways that i i don't think i could do it and Mm -hmm. so i think he would be a phenomenal person for you to interview um I could think of a multitude of, of others that I don't know people I don't know would love to hear, but I think that's the one that, that you know, uh, I think Val is kind of the quiet restorative justice practitioner, which I think it would be great to hear from her too and hear her voice. Um, um, I will reach out to both of them and then hey. hopefully one of them will respond to you. How's that? Beautiful. Yeah. Love it. 
<laughs> and then finally, how can people support you and your work in the ways that you want to be supported? Oh, that's, that's a great, another great question. I, you know, I've been so fortunate in, in how people have supported me so far. I think that, um, <clears throat> how I would want to be supported is the community groups that I've been working with to some degree, um, recognize the value of, of what this is, this process, have them be really creative in how we can extend this into our community to some degree. Like I can, I can preach it from the, you know, the school steps as a unis, university professor, I go like, this is what we need to do. You know, there's a certain level of weight that comes with that voice. But there's some community groups that I work with, I think, that are in the community and <clears throat> their capacity. I would like for them to, and this is kind of odd because I think it's easy to default with me to be the person who comes in like, oh, yes, I do circle work and stuff like that. But to figure out how to empower that community to be able to go into the broader community and say, this is what we do. We're restorative justice people. And this is, we, we want the community to become a restorative justice community. That's a, that's a, mm -hmm. that's a vague, I, that's not a really good answer to that, but that's, I want to go with that one to some degree in that the communities I work with kind of understand the importance of, of how this is needed in the community we work with and how they can help organize communities to come together, you know, if, if that makes sense. That's a very good This one. might be the one time, the last question that I redirect you. Great. This is often more framed as like a call to action to listeners. How can they support the work that you're doing? And read the chapter. <laughs> it's hard. To, it's really hard for somebody like me to say, read the chapter. Um, there will be a quiz. Yeah, yeah, there <laughs> is. Um, you know, think about... Um, how to hold spaces where where people like me can come in and do circle process and do restorative justice work in the communities. Um, and I, I guess have them to start to think about, I'm not really answering this very well either, have them to start think about more of, you know, I think we're so ingrained in this retributive justice system that's the default that we understand and the how do we separate ourselves? Like, think about how do I separate myself from it being the default? And when something happens in a community where harm is done, how can I think in terms of stepping into this and say, there's a different way to do this that focuses more on the healing than a crime that's been committed? No, no, I mean, it's beautiful. And so I want to uh, replug the book, uh, living, uh, sorry, listening, uh, to the movement, uh, y your chapter will be linked, um, in the show notes. Um, uh, but, uh, are there any other words you want to leave the people with? I just, I, I appreciate you doing this. I mean, I, I, I'm just so honored to be in this space. It is, it is hard for me. Cause I, I try to like, Oh, you know, I, I, you know, want to want people to have their voice, want people to have their voice. And I'm blathering on about myself, but I, I do appreciate the work that you're doing. And I guess if there's any way to answer it in a tangible way of how to support what I'm doing is to listen to what you're doing, you know, and to just share your podcast with other people, because I think you have done an amazing, you've got such a wonderful lineup of people that you've interviewed that have such a wealth of knowledge. And I think that's why it's hard for me to answer that question, because I don't think it, you know, you just have done something that is so amazing I'm surprised I hadn't heard it before. And so now it's like, it's going to be required listening for my students. And I think if there's any way to support what I'm doing is to support what you're doing. That's the answer that I love yeah. to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Because well, I don't think so I can do what you've done. I mean, I could do it in the classroom setting. And I think that we both have our, our way of doing it. And for me, it's in the class. I mean, that's, that's the only way I know to do it is, it, is I'm in the class with students. And if I can, you know, have 30 students buy into it. And by the end of the semester, I've done my job. If I can have 10 of them buy into it, I've done my job. If you want to support me, you know, become a social work student, take my class, and then I'll te teach you about restorative justice. We'll learn it together. And then you'll go a social worker. And But I think if they want to do it in the community, listen to what you're doing, you know, read what we're writing and just say, we've got to do it in the, we've got to expect our communities to be more restorative. That's, that's what I would hope. And I'm just so honored that you asked me. I, 
I, I don't think you'll grasp how much this means to me that you've asked me to be here to be a part of this. It's, it's a great deal to me. So, well, um, you've you've shared so much of yourself, um, and I know the the wisdom from your stories and experiences will will resonate with folks. So, thank you for being here. To everyone else, uh, thank you for listening. We'll be back with another conversation with someone living this restorative justice life next week. Until then, take care. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. One thing that I really appreciated about this episode was Daniel thought outside the box, well, circle rather, to promote circle values in the classroom. One thing he suggested was you can even sit in circle in the classroom because putting the teacher at a higher power level automatically happens whenever you're in a classroom setting, but creating an even playing field, even just physically, by having a circular seating arrangement can help promote those connections. What are some other ways that you can think of to promote restorative justice values in an unconventional way? As always, thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week. Like what you heard? Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast on whatever platform you're using right now. Or if you're old school, tell a friend. It really helps us further amplify this work. You can also support us by following us on our social platforms, signing up for our email list, signing up for a community gathering, workshop, or course. So many options. Links to everything in the show notes. Or on our website, amplifyrj.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.